and welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Writers Tool Shed. It is, of course, Richie here today, and I'm joined by a very special guest, fantasy author and real life builder of fantasy worlds, John Tarot. John, how the devil are you? I'm very, very good. Yes. Glad that winter's over, it seems. So, uh, you know, some really, really nice weather coming on, which is always good. Yeah, I've been uh, enjoying the spring very much at the moment, being able to get outside and do a bit of reading, leaning against a few trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always good. Always good. I love, like, you know, when everything starts to come back into bud, it's really good. Yeah, most definitely. So I've been excited to bring John onto the show for a chat about world building because, as you may not already know, John has converted his house in Essex into something quite magical. And it's called Talison House and Gardens. And John, do you want to tell us a little bit about your project? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I've always been a writer ever since I was quite young. And um, I, you know, as you know, with, you know, being a fantasy writer yourself, we, we just live inside these fantasy worlds and when I came to um, buy a house I realized quite early on that the house I wanted to live in and the house I could have afforded were just miles apart (laughs) Um, and um, but what I decided to do um, is I decided to uh, create my perfect writing space you know my perfect place to write and I took over um, uh, one room and converted that into a 1929 investigator's office (laughs) Uh, the way I like to think about it is if you took sort of Fox Mulder back into the 1920s that would be his office so it's got it's filled with books and arcane tomes and you know all of that sort of thing And um, when that was finished, um, I didn't want to be anywhere else in the house. And uh, uh, and it really was my perfect place to write. I've I've written um, I've written all my novels in there and I love going in there. And um, so one of my friends just commented and said, well, why don't you do another room? And that started me on what eventually became Talliston. Um, And every room is set in a different time and place. And they're yeah. all inspired by places I went to around the world. Nice. Um, and I came into the house with just an imagination. I couldn't wire a plug. I couldn't, <laughs> you know, I couldn't, uh, I didn't have any building experience or interior design experience. Um, but I, when I saw that first room, which I just did with uh, myself and my dad, um, it was so immersive and it was you know it just showed us exactly what our environments are and why we were you know why why we react well in those environments and um yeah and eventually turned into a 25 year journey um (laughs) I was 25 I was 25 when I started and I was basically you know doing it as I went along with the money that I had I wasn't independently wealthy you know it was just the money I had at the end of the month yeah and um yeah and and uh in it started in um, 1990 when I was 25 and it finished in 2015 when I was 50 (laughs) so Uh, it was yeah it's a real sort of half a life project yeah Um, but um but uh yeah and the the first people that saw it uh were the times uh they came up and I was absolutely terrified because uh the previous week, the journalist had been to Liz Hurley's six million pound Gloucestershire mansion. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, she's coming to! And just to tell people, it's a, uh, uh, it well, it's basically the the uh, the UK's most ordinary house. It's a three bedroom, semi detached ex council house in Essex. Yeah, and I thought, oh, they're going to hate it. And um, the journalist said she was just blown away by the whole thing, and she called it. Um, in the article Britain's Most Extraordinary Home and after that that's when people wanted to come and see it and uh, you know so yeah so that's Talliston in a nutshell but it's it's uh, you know if if people go to the website uh, they'll be able to see videos and rooms I mean I'm sure you've had a few hours pouring through all all the stuff on there 
There's a brilliant um, video when you go on the homepage, isn't there? That takes you on a tour around the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was... It... <laughs> Talliston's experiential, basically. It's not really something just to look at, but um, but it, it does give you a really good overview of all the different styles and the rooms and 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 where they are. Uh, but they're all really rooms that were inspired by my perfect places. So yeah. um, the kitchen is in New Orleans from 1954. Nice. Um, and that's your perfect Sunday morning breakfast. Um, there's a cabin in the woods um, from Canada. Um, and it's only about 10 feet from the back of the house. But actually, when you're inside, it's completely, you just feel like you're in the middle of the woods. You just feel like that's where you're going to get murdered. You know, think, uh, <laughs> the axman's going to yeah, come out. Yeah. I it think that really was my does. favorite one when I was looking at the pictures. And I was saying to my girlfriend, because we, we are going to come down and stay oh i'd love you to come yeah. down yeah and um yeah that was the one that grabbed me like the cabin in the woods so i think we'll, uh, if it's free the yeah. weekend we're able to come down and i'll be yeah, absolutely and then um because um because it sort of took so long you know i i was going on i was traveling to places bringing stuff back um, so it really was the, like the journey of creating it. And um, it did feel like creating a novel, you know, yeah. because such a, you know, I mean, I know when I embarked on my first novel, the thought of writing, you know, like 85,000 words, 100,000 words is just daunting. You know? <laughs> uh, the what's the word count of Pariah's Lament? What, what's... That was 110. And oh, to be honest, no, yeah. I, it probably could have been longer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've actually... <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. Um, but um, especially with fantasy, because there's a lot to tell. Yeah. In fantasy, there's a lot. You know, you have to set up a lot um, that you don't have to do if you're writing a contemporary sort of uh, yeah. thriller or whatever. You know, everybody can just imagine. It. You can just say, "Oh, a police car drove up," and that everybody knows. <laughs> you know that there's a whole yeah. uh, image and 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 description that you don't have to do a horse and but, wagon police cars yeah trundling, yeah. trundling down the street <laughs> yeah but the, that, that see that's the thing about fantasy then you have to say well who's driving it because it's not yeah. obvious that it you know whereas if a police car pulls up you've already imagined who yeah. you know what they're dressed as and everything you know you just don't yeah don't, that's the big problem, I think, isn't it? It's it with, is with world building, like going into all these details and then knowing how much to include. Do you have to describe what the police are wearing? Do you have to explain the history of how they got the name and stuff like yeah, that? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just go yeah, off yeah. on mad tangents. Yeah, you do, and and there's a lot of stuff that um, it's it's fifty fifty whether it should be in there or not. I mean, some people love it and some people don't. Um, and for, for Talliston, it is, I mean, there's, um, there's over, well, I should say, I'm an author, I should say more than, more than 2,000 objects that I brought back from 27 different countries. So, um, you know, the, um, but, um, but the, the, the lovely thing about it is when it was complete, I actually sat down and, and um, I had... Um, an offer from a publisher to write a non-fiction book about how we built it and everything. Um, yeah. Because I, I talk about we, because by the end of the project, 138 people had worked on it and that's creatively yeah. <laughs> volunteers and everything, you know, that's yeah. not people who did building and put the electric in. Uh, they're people who did the stained glass. We had a blacksmith working on it who worked on all the, all the blacksmith work. Um, people who did the, the, willow and hazel weaving and i mean just just incredible list of people you yeah. need you know, um, when you're building something like that and um i had to learn as i went so um the central room which i also think you'll find is really cool is based on a 13th century tower in wales oh nice because <laughs> I, was, I was the kid who was running around um castles when i was young with a sword yeah. You know, I just wanted a castle, you know, yeah. or a tower. I, you know. Know, I'll be honest, right? Me and my girlfriend have been looking for houses now. And obviously, you, you think about like what you did, what your, uh, your dream home would be. 
Absolutely. I, I, I just think I just think I live in a castle in the middle of a lake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or well, just a big lovely, tower. The lovely thing is, um, you know, we get estate agents coming to Telliston and they say things like, um, uh, well, this has blown my entire sales pitch out of the water because normally they're saying location, location, location. Yeah. And when you go into the tower, all the um, because it's been taken over by uh, by the Victorians as a midwinter retreat. So, you know, and uh, all based on Arthur Conan Doyle going away um, just after Study in Scarlet came out. And uh, I was looking into you know, when they used to go away to Italy in the summer and they used to go away for these retreats and they used to be writers and artists and they used to yeah. go off photographing, pho photographing fairies or, they, you know, whatever they <laughs> did, do Ouija boards or whatever, because that yeah. used to be the thing to do after dinner. And, um, and just that vibe that somebody's taken over a tower um, yeah. and in the late Victorian period and, and put all the bits in and we've got a chapel area that's now the dining room and... Nice. And all of this, as I describe it, the problem is there are a lot of people that have gone out and tried to do this and failed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've seen quite a few programs, you know, they, they, you know, where people are trying to do a fantasy house in, you know, I'm doing the bunny ears now. Yeah. Uh, but um, we did everything completely properly and correctly so I went to um, a place to learn how to line render so all the walls so in the original council room we built a stone room inside it so you could get the right acoustic and the right you know everything sort of themes from ships and you know and all the fireplaces and everything they're all authentic you know it's not actual you know it's not plastic painted over or something yeah. Um, so, so, and that's why it took so long as well. Definitely. So, uh, so it, you know, I know what it sounds like when I start describing it. Um, the living room that I've just said that the tower, um, somebody, when I described it said, oh, that sounds like a very badly themed Essex pub. Um, <laughs> and I suppose it does when you start to, you know, you start to say it with beams and, you know, all of this and plasterwork and stuff. But, um, but how it is, um, is, you know, how, how it eventually turned out. And that's why we put the videos on the site, really, because I wanted to yeah. show people the level of detail <laughs> rather than think that we just threw a tapestry over a sofa and called it medieval. So. Oh, no, the level of detail is amazing. Like, I mean, it's, I, sometimes you think like Crystal May's medieval, if you remember that TV show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, it is all just like. Uh, cardboard cardboard bricks and stuff like that the, the, the detail in Talliston if you go on the website the link is in will be in the description as well um it's amazing honestly and I was some guy I work with uh, Jeff occasionally listens to the uh, the show Jeff uh, hello if you listen. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff used to be a um copywriter for an interior design company and he was looking at them photos and he was absolutely blown away. And he was going, the guy who made that has got to have some kind of like, you know, master's degree in interior design or something like that. No, I couldn't amazing. Work like, that. Amazing. no I've got nothing. And But the thing was, um, I, you know, again, having an imagination, I think was the key thing that made Taliston. Um, because when we were doing um, the Japanese room, um, which was like the penultimate room, um, I wanted to set that in the future. And I wanted to, I wanted to take a, a Japanese tea house, but create it all in wood and glass as if it was some futuristic version of it. And that was a really difficult thing because everything up until that point had been in the past. And Talisman's not about living in the past. It's about sort of building something for now it's it's yeah. about now i don't want to live in victorian england i mean god almighty could you imagine living there with all their oh snobbery and their smog and oh you know but um Jesus. yeah exactly exactly um but um but the whole idea of um the japanese room was again I worked with um, uh, a company that do sort of garden rooms because it was essentially a conservatory, if you like. 
Yeah. And two of the architects just walked off the project because they said what I wanted was impossible. Now, it's not <laughs> impossible because we've done it, um, yeah. but they, they couldn't see it. They couldn't imagine it. Yeah. Um, and I'm not an artist. So, you know, eventually I had to go down to Ikea and buy a little square because it's all obviously all glass. And I bought those little square mirrors that you get that you make up into bigger mirrors and just created it all out of those so that they could see what I was trying to put across. So, yeah. Did yeah. you send them a picture when it was finished? <laughs> well, when the when the managing director came round, uh he just was a gog. He was just, he said, I cannot believe that this, this room, because the one thing about it is a conservatory normally has a view and we used all this opaque glass. So yeah. you just get all the reflections and everything. And um, it, it just, so you're not looking, you know, if you could see through one wall, you would be able to see my neighbor's sort of wooden fence. <laughs> yeah. um, that's not there. And, and the company said, this is amazing because you don't, you don't think about these sorts of things because, you know, people just expect to have a conservatory looking out over, I don't know, like, you know, the Lake District or something. They've always got those beautiful views out the window. And I yeah. said, well, I don't have beautiful views. So you just look inside. And I yeah. think that's, that's a really big thing for the house. Um, the byline for the house is the secret lies within. And it was, it was, everybody thinks it's, oh yeah, well, you know, the secret, um, to, you know, you walk past this house, it's on an ordinary street in a little town out in Essex and um, would never give it a second look. Um, and, but look what's inside. Yeah, um, but actually, what it is, it's about the secret being inside all of us, and it doesn't matter whether you're writing or you want to play the, you know, piano or you know whatever. Um, you know, you have to put those hours in, and you, you know, you can get there. Uh, yeah. You have a horizon point. I always say to people, if you've got horizon point, um, just if every day you take one step towards it, a bit yeah. like writing a book. You know, as long as you write something every day. Yeah, it will, you get there, but people are just put off because it seems such a daunting task. It's all progress. You've got to chip away, haven't you? That's the that's a great um, lesson for everyone yeah. there. Thanks. Yeah, so, as you know, without aware, being a fantasy author, world building is probably the most challenging, but it's aspect of writing a, uh, of the genre, I should say. But at the same time, it's probably the most fun, as you've no doubt had building your house. So how did you find writing Talliston after building your own real life fantasy world? Was it easier or were you, did you ever <laughs> get into a situation where you were like, well, actually this room doesn't fit with me book right now? Well, I wasn't going to start again. Yeah. I think, and I mentioned before, you know, this whole idea of um, having a publisher, the publisher wanted to publish a non-fiction book about how we built the house. Um, but I'm not that sort of writer. And yeah. so I said, no, I, I want to write a, um, a fantasy novel. And it's, um, and I've, I've set it, um, I've set it at the sort of what they call young adult, but that's because I wanted to tell a universal story and I wanted it to be read by everyone. I yeah. didn't want to just have adults reading it. I wanted it to be very accessible. Um, and, um, and I took an ordinary boy into an ordinary house and then he falls through into the labyrinth of of all the rooms in the different times and places and um i had um the house had lots of things in it and the first draft i mean it was easier because normally a fantasy author is writing about something in their head yeah. and you know i was writing about something that i was sitting in obviously <laughs> go into each of the rooms yeah. um, and plot things out. I mean, there's one bit in the kitchen where he has to get this palmistry hand off a shelf and it's quite high up. And I got my friend's 12 year old son to mm. and just let him loose in the kitchen and said, how would you reach that? And yeah. then just wrote down what he did because, you know, nice. to, to, to make sure it was real. Right. But the hardest thing was when you've got something real, and this is another little lesson about world building, and we've just mentioned that, 
is the first draft of the book had a lot of description in it. It had yeah. a lot because the rooms are so rich. And um, what I did was eventually chop that up and sort of scattered it through the chapter. Yeah. So, so because it doesn't matter what genre you're writing, you've got to be true to the story and the yeah. story is important. And that's what I think that people do get bogged down with world building in fantasy is the fact that all of a sudden you've lost the plot. Yeah. <laughs> literally. literally, yeah, lost the plot. Yeah. So, um, so the first draft of The Stranger's Guide to Taliston, which is what it eventually turned out to be called, um, was more about the house and not about the boy. And we had to raise the bar for, for the boy and yeah. start to sort of, you know, dampen down the house, if you like, the passages. But what I found was I just cut bits out and then gave you enough so that you got a really good idea of the room. Yeah. Then peppered it through the chapter and sort of said, well, I really want to mention this bit, but I'll mention that later. You know, yeah. rather than you walk into a room and you just see everything. Um, the other thing which I'd mention is that writing the book was difficult because when you walk into, um, uh, say you walk into the living room, you get that wow factor yeah. um, because you're walking into somewhere and it's just not what you expect. But of course, writing as a novel, you could write anything. You could open a door and walk into a volcano. So, mm -hmm. You, you know, and it's not a surprise. Well, it's a surprise, I suppose. But, but you know, because it's on the page, you can write anything. Yeah. And so the thing that I found really exciting is the fact that obviously in Talliston, each of the rooms is only one room of a much larger house. So the tower in Wales, you only see one bit of one floor. So what I saw quite early on was I want to see more of the tower. I want to go up onto the battlements and this particular tower is in Snowdonia. So I want to, you know, get a view off the top of the tower. I want to go out into the forest. I want to go, you know, so because you yeah. can't do that at Talliston, but you can do that in the book. Nice. And, and that, was, that was really, really fun. And because I'm a great journal writer, when I go away on holiday, yeah. I plowed through all those little details um, uh, for just little anecdotes and characters and people. So there's a tree house at Talliston in the attic. It's from Cambodia. And when I went to Cambodia, our guide was called something, his name was so long. <laughs> and so he said, oh, just call me Mr. Sharkey. And so in the book, I do have a character called Mr. Sharkey because he was so, he was one of those people that as a writer, he was such a character. Yeah. And I wanted to capture honor, him in the yeah honor him in a way. I think I, I like to oh, yeah. be interested in people and meet. I like to think it's like honoring them by including them in your story because they've left such an impression on you that you that you want to include them. I think that's yeah. a great thing to do. I think some people are a bit uneasy though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as as that that you know, you see that meme come up. You know, don't ever uh, don't ever anger an author because they'll put you in a book and kill you. Yeah. Um, so, but but I think that even if you're writing fantasy, I think that world travel um, and going to places and experiencing what it's like to step into a world that you don't understand or a culture yeah. that you don't understand and everything really does give you a depth to your writing because yeah, nothing, yeah, because nothing is wasted. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, I've got a fantasy book, which will never be published. Um, I started writing it when I was 16 and finished it sometime when I was about 30 ish. And I kept coming back to it. And it's got, I, it's never been edited. It's just, you know, <laughs> it's about 200,000 words. It's like, it, it's called the mortal and his God. And, um, it is just high fantasy and yeah. it, it, it just, I've got a great fondness for it, but it's just 
the worst fantasy <laughs> book ever. It's just it's yeah. got so many cliches and things, and you know, but it's because you have to get that book out, I suppose. You, do, yeah. you have to go through that stage. And um there are some bits that crept into other places. Yeah, it's not all wasted. Uh, like, it's a training ground, isn't wasted. it? Your first novel. No, it's not wasted. Because yeah. I you know, it's like, like going back to that um playing the piano you know they say for anybody to get to that point where it's just natural you have to put in your 10,000 hours and I think that that um that is why I say to people just write you know yeah just write doesn't matter what you write um whether it's uh um whether you want to start in the middle of a novel and just write a scene or a battle or whatever you want to do yeah. um you can always use it um, and and I found that in you know because I was uh, riffing off an actual house. Of course, these were all things I loved. So the scenes in the 1920s have very much a Lovecraftian sort of feel to them because they're all yeah. set in New York. Um, there, there's um, there's medieval sort of you know not quite fantasy, but very you know dark age medieval sort of uh vibes in some of nice. some of the things some are set in ireland where they see things that happened with the high kings and everything so all the stuff that i'm really really into yeah uh, so yeah so that's great is there something that you love above all about world building what what draws you to it you've invested so much of your life into building <laughs> these things like what 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 is it that uh sort of motivates you I think I think for the ha- for the house if I do the house first and then do the writing I think the house first um when you're when you're in Talliston um it just takes you out of not reality because people always say oh we'd like to interview you about your fantasy house and I go what fantasy <laughs> it's not <a> fantasy <laughs> yeah you know, it's, it's real you can come and have tea there yeah. um and and it's you know it is a real place, um, and I always say you know Taliston isn't the way the world is, but according to me, that's the way the world should be. Yeah. You know, the world <laughs> is losing that magic, you know, that we that we want, and we have to turn to books and everything. So yeah. so world building in the house was all about creating that perfect environment because you don't have to own a cabin in Canada to have the experience of owning a cabin in Canada. And you don't, you know, I mean, up in the uh, loft, when you climb up there and go into the Cambodian treehouse, there's no windows and it's always night up there and you can hear yeah. sounds of the creaking of the tree and everything. And yeah. it just instantly transports you. Um, and I think that I needed that, obviously. So, so that was, you know, to invest into something that you love. It was never a chore, really. I mean, there was some hard yeah. things that we had to do, but you know, and I wasn't doing this every day. I mean, obviously, the, you know, over twenty-five years, I wasn't like getting up every day. I had a full-time job, so yeah. you know. But um, so I, I just love the sourcing of things and the stories behind all the objects and all of that sort of stuff. World building for me on the page is all about the landscape of the world linked to your central theme. Because I think that one of the things is, I think that if you're going to write a fantasy novel, I think that the themes in the book need to need to sort of be reflected in the landscape. And what I mean by that yeah. is a bit like um, when they used to believe that, um, uh, I think it's in one of the films like Excalibur or something, where it's all winter because the king is sick and then yeah. the land goes into this eternal winter or whatever it is. And I, I love that. And, and I love the, the idea that, when you open a book, the landscape of your character, your central character, is the landscape you find yourself in. So, you know, um, and I, I don't think it, you should just set your novel in a fantasy world and not, and could set it anywhere else. You know, I, th- I think yeah. it, has to, it really has to fit into, um, into that landscape. Yeah, that's and, really I, good and, and um, so in the, 
Stranger's Guide to Talliston. We don't actually start in Talliston. Um, the boy in that lives in an abandoned school bus in the middle of a wooded roundabout, um, which is just down the road here near Stansted Airport, where uh, <laughs> outside Great Dunmo. And the reason I picked that is because um, that piece of forest, um, when they tarmacked all around it, um, it was um, part of, and, it, and the roundabout is called Priory Wood Roundabout, and there used to be Thremhall Priory on, on this land. And the last piece of ancient forest is actually in the middle of this roundabout. Yeah. And I love that landscape, you know, the fact that here's something ancient sitting on a very modern thing. Yeah. And... Um, so so i think with with world building my you know i think it's even though you're picking fantasy i think that the landscape of that world has to mirror your central theme yeah give you an example say something like june june couldn't have been set on any other world apart from a desert it that, that the whole story everything all the themes all the you know all the characters everything the desert yeah. is like a character isn't it in the book yeah, yeah it, is. It, it sets everything um and i think that um i think that that's the sort of thought process really that i went through um with the rooms because you know you can only have there, there were only three bedrooms and one was an office so you know you spent a lot of time really getting those environments so yeah. that they really like you know resonate and do you think uh, that helps you when you're choosing what details to include do you just focus on what's relevant to the story rather than uh, what's necessary uh, yeah i think that um i think that um if you've got a character that um that is going to go through sort of you know hardship and 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 it's going to rise to be some somebody great I think that again, when you look at the world that you're setting in, you need that harshness, and then you know, but but where they're going to rise to, you need a place where they rise to, if you see what I mean. So they might yeah. start in the slums of somewhere, and you see this in fantasy films all the time. I mean, you know, classic one is Lord of the Rings, where they they start out in the Shire. And they end up in Mordor and then they go back to the Shire and the Shire has changed. And, and I think that those sorts of um, things in world building, it's not just about a set that your characters are standing in. Yeah. Has to, you have to interact with it and it has yeah. to be part of the story. Um, and, and that's where I would start, I would yeah. say um because i always set the characters and i've got this list of things that i go through and one of them is what is the main character's ghost what is the thing that haunts them yeah and um everybody's got a ghost <laughs> you know everybody's yeah. got something in their life that they would change or something that's happened to them that they carry around or whatever yeah and um and i think that that i always try and link that to to the landscape so in the strange guide to Talliston the boy Joe has been abandoned by his parents and put in this bus and said, look, wait here, we'll come back for you. And then they don't come back. And yeah. I think that, that sense of starting the story in that very ordinary place in the middle of a roundabout in an abandoned bus, that is his loneliness and everything. So that when you actually get to the fantasy element where he steps through into the labyrinth and goes into all these um you know, wonderful locations all yeah. around the world. Um, that it's almost like going from um, uh, you know Wizard of Oz, Kansas in black and white into yeah. color, and and I think that that's that's something with world building is it really is your palette of colors, and you need to choose your colors wisely because you don't just want to say, oh well, I need a. Uh, um, I need a place where these these people live or these people live or these. I think that it should really come from um, uh, how it serves the story yeah. uh, and how that how that environment, whether it's a mountain environment or it's going to be, it's going to start off 
uh, by the sea and then end up in the capital city or, you know, whatever it's going to be, it should actually mirror your character's uh, journey, their epic quest, really, and, and mirror that. Um, yeah, that's a great bit of advice. I think it's the biggest you. challenge, isn't it? Um, finding the right balance between too little and straying into the realm of the info dump, which yeah. everyone yeah. hates. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that the um, the key to really world building is the fact that you you need to add enough so that it will kickstart somebody's imagination. Yeah. But leave you know leave space. Um, I, I I go back to books all the time, and I I sort of think oh, there was this great scene where I go back. And when you actually read the words on the page, there's not actually a lot of description. And I go, oh, I created all of that. You know, yeah. I mean, it's fine now when we see, you know, Ian McKellen as, as Gandalf, because that was based upon the paintings that were done. And, you know, and we all know what Gandalf looks like now. Yeah. Um, but if you go back to Tolkien's original drawings of Gandalf, it's nothing really like that at all. You know, <laughs> he, he looks like a sort of scrawny, um, uh, you know, I, I think he was supposed to be the sort of, you know, like the Woden character, wasn't he? he yeah. was supposed to be the, and, but, but of course, that's not, what you know, now Gandalf is the, you know, the epitome of all wizard sort of characters. But, but again, they weren't like that. They were much more like Strider who went around and they, you know, I mean, he was quite disheveled, I suppose, in the film. Yeah. But, 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 um, but, you know, th th those sorts of, um, those sorts of revelations where you go back to your favorite book and go, actually, there's not a huge description here. What the author has done is they've given me enough. Yeah that I've filled in all the details. I was chatting to someone about this recently, actually, and we were comparing people's reactions or our reactions as well to books where you're given all of the details to books where you're given just a handful of detail. And you always engage more with the one where there's less because you have to fill in the gaps. You yeah. have to build the picture in your mind whereas yeah. if you if it's all spoon fed it's just it's not as engaging is it really it's just there that's why we watch television because it's there but with reading we have to i think we we look for ways to engage with stories and those little details just given enough to make to immerse people and to show them that the world is real and lived in i think that's yeah. what most people picked out when um they were commenting on pariah's lament talking about how little details like kids playing a game just in the background. That was one sentence of a kid play, a group of kids playing a game, which I just made up. And that gives people, I think four different book reviewers commented on that one thing. And it was just the fact that it, it helped make the world feel lived in. And yeah. The, yeah. doing it at relevant points and doing so, like you mentioned before, in a way that's natural the story you're not forcing it in any way the characters are going through this and these natural opportunities um crop up that you can add little details and that is i yeah. think that's the key the other thing that you can do which i i found through my journals so when i go away on holiday i want to try and capture the feel of what it feels yeah. like um, the thing that photographs don't. Photographs can give you a memory jog about what it was like to go to the place. Yeah. But actually what I wanted to do was I wanted to capture how it felt and much yeah. more, you know, and and when I when I say, oh, I, you know, go away and write travel journals, everybody thinks that my travel journals, you know, like a lot of people's is like, oh, we got up, we went to this museum, <laughs> we did who did the, but it isn't it's about oh. people watching it's about sitting yeah. in a cafe and trying to sort of describe all the smells um, yeah. that I can smell that are different or you know what what can I sense around me um, just because I want to be able to go back um, afterwards yeah. and, 
and just be in those places. And I, I found that um, that's a really, really good trick. And you don't have to go to exotic places. You can just drive into town and sort of sit in a cafe and just try and people watch and see what, you know, uh, and, and just just be present in, yeah. in, in a moment and just say, well, what's different about this or what strikes you yeah. uh, about people? And I think that um, with, you know, with world building, I think there are some people that sit down and create their entire world, almost like a sort of D&D campaign, and then sort of add the plot to it. Um, but I think that, you know, that's what I was saying earlier on. It's almost like actually, um, you know, the spaces, the, 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 the bits on the map that are, blank you know the here be dragons yeah that you've got to leave that space for the reader you can't uh you know you 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 know can you imagine a book where you actually get up and you describe everything you do till you go to bed i mean it would just be the most boring thing um, uh, what you're saying there about the um like going out and just as an exercise i think that's fantastic and I, i think i've done it in the past where you say you just get a piece of uh, a little notepad, make five columns for each sense and just see what you can, yeah, you can feel yeah. or like taste, yeah. taste. Uh, like so many of the senses, especially when we're describing things, are so underused. And if you think about the like smells, like how, how many times do smells jog memories of different things? Well, well, smells are supposed to be the, the deepest memory, aren't yeah. they? I had a I had an instance of that actually um, where I went to um, went to America and I had a friend um, who lived down the road another Richie um, when I was younger and he always used to come down and play with me and my brother after he'd had his dinner and had a bath on Friday night and so he always smelled of this particular talcum powder because that's <laughs> what he had. Yeah. And I have not smelt that smell, like that talcum powder is not sold anymore, whatever. And I walked into a pharmacy in America and just somebody walked past and they had a similar smell and yeah. that, you know, Richie's face just appeared in my head after all of those years, have not, have not seen him since I was about seven years old because they moved yeah. away. And that is the power of, of smell. And yeah. in Taliesin, we use smells um, uh, and scents and incense and, and, you know, all of this stuff to really give you that, that element of where you are. Because, yeah. um, uh, and there's sounds in each of the rooms and they're so subtle, but if you didn't have them there, a dimension would be lost. So yes, yeah, 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 all the senses and also the emotions as well. Emotions, definitely, yeah. That when you walk into somewhere, um, and this is the show don't tell thing. I mean, there's a there's a place for, for I don't know how that ever came to be a phrase because obviously yeah. there are times where you need to tell a story and it works really well in the in the whole novel. Yeah. But but what that really means is that when you walk into a room you need to show the emotion and the feelings and everything of of that character that um that when you walk into a room it's the emotion emotional connection um that is a lot of time in fantasy sort of you know people don't get right because they 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 leave that out or whatever and i think it's it's um i mean i'm um i'm reading at the uh, at the moment the uh, the book of Coley and the second one the, the trials of Coley I think it is um, and it's amazing how um, M.R. Carey uses emotion in that main character instead of description in a lot of times you know that yeah. they will talk about these plants that come alive and everything and I thought they're not telling me anything about these plants what do they look like whether but yeah. it's all what it feels like to be in a forest that actually can move and will kill you yeah and 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 it's quite interesting because when i went back it doesn't actually describe a lot of the these actual trees and things it just leaves it to the imagination that you can imagine what they look like and everything yeah. but it's the fear and that 
you know, mu you mu mustn't make a sound because they can track it and all of this, that that's the bit that, um, so you're internalizing it, yeah. even though you're talking about, about the world. Um, that's so, a brilliant yeah. way, yeah. Something I do when I um, go through the editing process is something, uh, it's called character plotting. And it's just something I made up on my own. So it's probably something else called character plotting, but this is what I just call it. Um, so what I do is chart the emotional journey of each character as they go through different sorts of points of conflict or plot points. And yeah. um, and then you can do it on a chart. So I just use a line chart. And each time you come to a point of conflict, little circle. And if, it's a, if the character fares well, the line goes up. And if it doesn't, it goes down. And that way you can see how the character develops and changes over uh, over this, the course of the story from an emotional perspective. Because like you say, it's the most important part. It's, mm. it, it, it's what makes things compelling. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that characters are the things that make my job as a writer more enjoyable. Um, yeah. And I think characters for me are the things that make me write because it it's almost like they're every time I stop writing, they're saying, no, write some more, you know, like write what I do next or and and I think that um, there's, um, you know, when you're writing a fantasy novel, whatever novel, but when you're writing a fantasy novel, you're not writing a travelogue. This isn't supposed to be a let's visit Middle Earth. Yeah. It's supposed to be a story um, about characters. Um, and I think that, um, you know, you've, you've only got to look at um, uh, the idea of, say, something like, um, I don't know if you know, Critical Role, where they just, the, the voice actors, they film them playing d d And... I always thought anybody watching a D and D game or something like this um, would be the most boring thing ever, but because they do all the characters and they've got the interplay with that, it's yeah. actually role playing on that level. And I think that um, you know when I was putting together uh, the Talliston novel, the characters that come through. Yeah. Um, because you go into a scene and you meet new characters and then the boy leaves them behind and goes to another area. Um, the characters have to be really compelling because yeah. you only get you don't get to sort of spend the whole book with them. It's almost like when he enters a room and he has to solve this and do that and then he leaves. Um, he's he's you know, so you only see a little snapshot of their lives. And so those had to be sort of mini adventures and mini um, uh, sort of scenarios in 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 that, yeah. and uh, there had to be a beginning, middle, end to all of their little stories. Otherwise, it would have felt really bitty um, yeah. through the story. And so, um, and each chapter is about I think it's about six thousand words. I think it's around that. So because there's only uh, there's thirteen chapters in the book because there's thirteen rooms of Talisman, and um, so um, each one is like a little mini story and yeah. it, it was a real trial to try and get that all into 6,000 words and make it feel complete and made it feel uh, because, you know, you might be in Ireland, in Mythic Island, or you might be um, in New Orleans in 1954, or you might be um, in, in Wales in 1887. And you had to get all of that you know the room the the setting the you know um uh and it, it you know obviously they were a lot longer and then you yeah. had to cut them back and everything so no, it's always the but um no but it's always yes yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah, no one wants it to remove yeah. isn't it it's always the biggest problem for me <laughs> yeah yeah and i also think that um you know a lot of the a lot of the comments you get, and you know when you've written something, um, it is the details. The details are the things that people remember. Yeah. Um, and um, the lovely thing about, about Talliston is once I finish the book, I put a few objects that weren't in the house um, into the tour because I, I do 
um, a tour of the house that's from the viewpoint of people who want to see it and see how it was created. But I also do um, a tour of the house from the viewpoint of people who have read the book who yeah. want to see, because as you step into each room, you're stepping into a chapter of a book. Yeah. Um, and um, I point out the objects in the room. I point out how we created some of the scenes because some of the, obviously I had a real room, so I couldn't just fudge it. If, if it says that you stand in this position and you can see this, you have to be able to do it. Yeah. And, um, and classically, there's one bit in the living room where there, I've got a Celtic leaf blade on the wall. Um, and I, that became one of the um, magical objects in the story nice. because the boy was being attacked. And I just looked around the room and said, well, what would you pick up? Yeah. And there was a sword on the wall. And I said, right, OK, that's what he'll pick up. And, and that, that was lovely. Um, but nice. the best object from that was um, he actually throws a message in a bottle over the sea when he's in Norway. And um, I've actually got the message in the bottle. It washes up in Japan all these hundreds and hundreds of years later. And yeah. it's all salt encrusted. And uh, that's always a little bit of a, a moment when people, you're taking them through the house and they see the bottle. It's really distinctive as well. Yeah. Um, in a cabinet and they go oh my god because you can see it's got a message in it so so I think that and those are the little things that you want to do on the page yeah. you want want to have those little details that really um that that people are going to carry with them uh, fantastic well John it's been absolutely lovely chatting to you about Talliston Wellville and fantasy it's it's we've covered a lot and i think it's been uh it's quite insightful as well to hearing someone who's who's dedicated so much their lives to 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 doing what they love and uh yeah it's been brilliant chatting with you so before yeah. we go is could you tell us about how we can visit talliston and yeah sure. we can find out sure. more yeah well i'm sure you'll um share links in the in the notes but um but the two destinations really um uh, is talisman.com and that's all about the house um, you can look at the rooms and um, that's got the list of how to visit um, and we've got various things from private visits to people can actually stay over we've got um, we've got a room called the haunted bedroom that uh, is <laughs> quite something if people want to try and stay over in that yeah. um, and then um, if from the book side of things, um, it's tarot.co.uk. Yeah. Um, and that actually, um, you can you can go into that. And then that's much more about the story and about the book. Um, and you can go through the labyrinth and click on the different bits of the labyrinth and go into the rooms, but it tells you it from the, not from the construction point of view, but from the story point of view. That's really good. So, cool. um, yeah, and uh, uh, and again, you can uh, from from those two, um, you can you know if you if you go to my uh, webpage tarot.co.uk, that will allow you to book me to take you around Talliston and uh, uh, from the story point of view. Yeah. Um, and then Talliston from, you know, if you want to come and have afternoon tea or whatever you want to do. But uh, I like the sound of the Enchanted Evening. Yeah, the Enchanted Evening. Well, that's because we do one in the evening because um, obviously it's all by candlelight. And um, it's, uh, yeah, and you get uh, you get the tour around uh, all the different rooms and then uh, sit down and have some supper and stuff. So that's great. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be going for that. So yeah, once again, John, thank you very so very much for, for coming on and chatting with no, us. No, that's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Nice one. So uh, yeah, and thank you all for listening as well. If you enjoyed, please um, tell your friends, share uh, Fantasy Writer Tour Shed with everyone. We do this because we enjoy helping you and giving you insights from really interesting people like John. So thank you very much for listening and uh, we'll speak to you soon.